I'm John McCarthy. I'm chief of the division of EMS at Lehigh Valley Health Network in Allentown, Pennsylvania. So I'm going to go over one of the most challenging part of our careers, our jobs uh, for EMS and emergency medicine is managing that really difficult airway. So the famous quote is, if there is no patent airway, breathing and circulation won't work. The airway is the initial, the most critical, and can be the most difficult component to save lives. I'm also the medical director of LVH and Medivac. So while we're really doing the difficult airway management for all situations, whether it's ground or in the emergency department, Air Medical has even another challenge because of the higher uh, level of care, the critical care um, for most of the patients that, uh, um, that they're going to be dealing with, but also sometimes difficult intubations that can't be done by other uh, MS providers uh, because of the location and sometimes even medications, plus the analogy of aviation. Um, really kind of plays well into the uh, management of airways as we go through this. So first analogy otherwise, IVs. They're easy. IVs are easier than intubations. So you have a 22-year-old and he's got a big old vein and he's across the room and you take an 18 gauge and throw it like a dart, got the IV in place, no problem. But now you have a two-day-old or you have a 79-year-old that has a vein the size of the 22-year-old but it's concrete. And the other one's an obese patient. So the situation is these are really difficult, although they're all IVs. How you approach it, your expertise, who's good at doing them, or the ones that have been doing it for a while, uh, and what's the, uh, the whole management is the same as uh, the management of difficult airways. It's not just straightforward in every single one, and there's different ways to approach that. So the most important part, a difficult intubation or difficult airway management is because you're not doing the basics exceptionally well. That's the difference. It's the fine-tuning of doing it correctly helps creep, uh, keep it from becoming a difficult airway. Yet, despite that, in, in, in uh, the careers that we do, the work that we do, in the environment that we do this, it can be difficult even if everything's done perfectly. So let's walk through that uh, again very quickly. ABCs, and when I say things aren't done right, this is really the fine-tuning that people get um, distracted from, get off of track, they're thinking of the more complex situations, where ABC is the same as in CPR. It's very basic. Airway, there's your choices. You pick one, whatever's appropriate. If you then achieved an airway one way or the other, then you can move on. If you haven't, you need to go to plan B. And again, we are air medical, and yet if you don't take care of the patient's airway, they're on final approach also. Breathing. Oxygenation and ventilation, two components. So we got a bunch of things we can do to provide the oxygenation and for ventilation. So yeah, pick one, whatever's appropriate for the situation that you're in. Circulation, same thing. Um, but you need to do them in order. No reason to even go doing CPR until you have the ABCs done or the A and B done. So people are thinking, oh, now the American Heart Association say it's not ABC anymore. It's uh, um, circulation with the chest compressions. Well, yeah, it's still ABCs. You have to have the airway and breathing. The whole point is not to spend the time to compromise on the chest compressions by doing other airway and breathing. So just positioning initially is the important part, but still, it's the exact same ABCs. So a bunch of literature out there, which I'll cover a, uh, a number of the uh, studies. Uh, this one's showing that EMS intubation has a worse outcome for traumatic brain injury. So as with any research, uh, any publication, you go through it and look in more detail. And when you, when you break it down, in reality, for this situation, uh, yeah, they had worse outcome. But when um, they got all the information together, it was really because, because of hyperventilation. Um, so when we do hyperventilate, which a lot of times out in the field, um, in the emergency department, um, catecholamines are up, uh, people are moving around quicker, and hyperventilation is very common. With this, with a head injury, it's clearly shown that uh, when, you, when you get the CO2 down in this study, 60% uh, of the time the CO2 was down below 25, and the mortality was uh, six times greater in those patients. But what they also identified was that the same thing was happening in the emergency department uh, and in the trauma bay. When the patient was intubated, they were often hyperventilated. And because of the hyperventilation, that's what caused the uh, worst outcome, not just because it was an uh, EMS um, in the field intubation. 
So we go through this as we're learning in school and medical school and paramedic class. We get these uh, analogies of, okay, here's our all ABCs in one picture. Uh, very complex. I try to keep things simple. This is really no different than an engine. And the reason I put this up is that if, if our car doesn't start, first thing we check is our, our, our gas gauge. Uh, are we empty or not? You don't go and get more complex uh, evaluations of the engine because the car wouldn't start. You check to see if the gas is, you know, if the, ga if the uh, gas in the gas tank first. Same thing with the airway. If we can't get a good pulse, people are checking or listening to heart sounds. Make sure you go through those uh, in, in the proper order. And yes, by the way, this is not actually an actual airway device. So let's evaluate our airway. I threw this picture in because it's a nice, um, at least a visual description of the airways that we are going to be dealing with. The nasopharyngeal versus the oropharyngeal. See, the nasopharyngeal is much larger than we actually think, uh, a bit more rigid. And again, I'm going to go into great detail. But when we talk about that, you can kind of put this image into perspective. So we have to decide, we're going to intubate the patient. So let's use our rules to figure out, should we intubate the patient or not? So that goes to the classic lemon. Uh, look externally, evaluate, malin potty clefts, uh, obstruction, and neck mobility. So well, I don't know if we have any elective EMS intubations, but let's go through the process. So L is for looking externally. E is the 332 rule. You have the patient open their mouth and put the three fingers there and two here. Uh, and some of our patients, though, it's a little different math, uh, 3, 1, 3rd, 22 in these two patients. And my favorite, the malin potty. Um, essentially, you have the patient stand up, stick their tongue out, and then you get a class 1 through class 4. So it's also interesting, this came from a dental hygiene uh, publication. So. It's, it's pretty nice when you can have the patient stand up and stick their tongue out. So we're going to evaluate our patients. Hmm. All right, that's, I think it's probably closer to a 4 or a 10. Obstruction on the lemon. Uh, external obstruction and internal obstructions. And neck mobility. You've got to take a look at you know, these situations because it really is a factor on what we do. So when you, when you put all the pieces together, the lemon is really the fruit for the anesthesiologist. They take all those rules and have their patients go through all that. Uh, and then they decide, okay, well, thank you for coming, sir. Uh, yeah, yeah, your lemon doesn't fit, so we're going to have to cancel the surgery and see you back in a month. And then come back a month later. I'm um, sorry, we have to cancel you again. You got a bad lemon. So for EMS, we, we don't have elective intubations. So this doesn't all apply, but it does uh, give some good tools to help um, evaluate the airway as far as the process, how we best do it, what's the best approach, uh, what's the best techniques to be able to do that. So these, to these tools uh, do give us some direction, but overall, um, I wish it was more elective for EMS as opposed to anesthesia. Now, one, one grade that is really more applicable for uh, EMS um, is the uh, comac lahane grade. So you actually put the... Um, the blade in the, in the uh, oropharynx, uh, and from the left, we can see everything you need. You see the vocal cords, the glottic opening. On the right, uh, you can't even see the epiglottis. And actually, with that, there's some studies done, one example, of how predictable was that of your success rates uh, for intubation, and this one even compared it to the uh, LMA. So for this uh, endotracheal intubation, 87.5% on the uh, grade one. Um, and 0% on grade 3. So it didn't even get to grade 4. So if you couldn't even, if you couldn't even see the epiglottis, at least it don't even bother. Even with the LMA, it went from a 90% to a 75% uh, success rate uh, to, on a grade 3. We can put these into categories also. Um, you know, more common sense also uh, from this approach. Category 1, airway is okay. Oxygenation is okay. Ventilation is okay but they still need to be put on the ventilator for uh, too many shots of whiskey uh, over the weekend at college. Um, or category two, the oxygenation is fine. You just have a comp uh, compromise of the airway. Just can't get uh, the tube or any other device down into the airway to, um, or even get to the uh, glottic opening. It's things like angioedema is one good example, uh, trauma, any other uh, injuries. Category three, the airway's fine. You can oxygenate, uh, 
um, or you can't oxygenate or ventilate well. So things like pneumonia, PE, uh, so the airway's fine, the lungs aren't working well. And category, category four is a combination of all of them. So you have a compromise of the airway, um, you can't oxygenate, you can't ventilate. So for every intubation, this is emergency medicine, it's is EMS, you always assume the worst. So for every intubation, be ready for a category four. Have it all there, you don't have to open things up, but have it all at bedside. Be very organized, anticipate what the worst case scenario can be. Um, with your stuff readily available, you don't want, there's nothing worse than having a problem and then someone else running out to try and get some of the other equipment off the aircraft or you know, getting the air, airway cart uh, out from the other area of the emergency department, have it all set. So first step to get the procedure done very, very well is pre-oxygenation uh, and ventilation. So passive oxygenation, that's really the, the nice thing that's become more apparent. Before we had the oxygen on, and when they stopped breathing, we figured, well, they're not going to get any more oxygen. You have to breathe for them. In reality, is the, the, um, even with the passive um, pre-oxygenation, it actually gets absorbed and hangs up with the uh, hemoglobin and can still then be transported. So we want to maximize as much as possible. We want to get as much oxygen on, as much hemoglobin as we can before we even start the procedure. Volume-wise, it, it's amazing that the little bit of difference, even the saturation, shows a fair amount of volume of the oxygen uh, hemoglobin uh, components. So continuous, about four to five minutes. Different studies show the time, but about five minutes is a, probably a good uh, estimation with the uh, pre-oxygenation before you even start to maximize that out. Positioning. Again, to make this the best mechanical process, how do we uh, get the best results to be able to get the oxygen in the ventilation, keeping the lung capacity. And so the position is a major component of that. It's about 20 degrees. Uh, a lot of literature will see 20 to 30 degrees. Um, but have you then sit up? If you have someone that's in congestive heart failure, you try and lay them down. It doesn't work. If you have an asthmatic patient, you try and lay them down. It doesn't work. Why? Because the mechanics of that uh, makes it much more efficient and effective to be sitting up. That big part of this is, again, get back to mechanically, get the stomach contents under the diaphragm. You lay them down, that's pushing up into our chest. So we have to inhale even more or even harder, even deeper, just to get the abdominal contents back out of the chest. So by sitting up, you certainly have that uh, huge component of gravity to help with that. Um, it makes the patient more comfortable. It gets everything set up nicely. But when you're ready to do the intubation, you put it then, you know, once the patient's, let's say, RSI'd, um, you can put them down in the best position for the mechanical intubation. They don't have to be, stay up at the 20 to 30 degrees. Lung capacity. So we're getting the oxygen in there, but let's get as much um, uh, oxygen in to the total capacity of the lung. As we're sitting, just hanging around, breathing, watching TV, we're using about 500 cc's per, uh, per breath. But the, the lung capacity can actually get an additional four liters on top of that. So the example I use is if you're going to go, um, go underwater, you're going to hold your breath. What do you do? You take a couple deep breaths, then you hold it in. So what you're, you're doing, you've maximized the amount of oxygen you can get in, and two, you've expanded your lung capacity. So we're doing the same thing for the patient before we, um, before we intubate them. Same thing when we go underwater. If we do that, we're going to stay down no longer. If we do that for the patient ahead of time, we're going to have more time to do the safe uh, intubation. Um, and positioning on top of that is uh, another good example of the lung capacity. Uh, in fact, that uh, final statement there, when the patient's supine, they have 50% decreased lung volume, the open alveoli. It's not the size of the lung, it's how many of the alveoli are open. open. That's the only place that the oxygen and CO2 exchange. So just with passive oxygenation itself, uh, normal adults, good positioning, 90%. To keep it on, it'll stay there, and then when it drops down to that 90% off and in good positioning and everything else, normal adults, eight minutes. Lots of time to do that. If you turn that oxygen off after they're paralyzed and you lay them down, it's going to go down much quicker. Even in the optimal situation uh, with the um, pre-oxygenation, uh, make the mapnic uh, obese patient, now about two minutes. And that's because of, one, the positioning, their lung capacity to begin with, um, the weight over top of the chest, as well as the abdomen, uh, all really cuts down that lung volume, cuts down your uh, pre-oxygenation status. 
So what's the best way to do the pre-oxygenation? So it is nasal airways, nasal cannula. So continuous. The nice thing with that is not only is it out of your way by doing it nasal, you can now you know, do the intubation through the mouth. You don't have to take the non-rebreather mask off again or the bag valve mask. Um, so mechanically, it makes a lot of sense. It's nice. The other good thing, it's more effective doing the nasal um, cannula uh, and the nasal airways um, just because of the mechanics, the picture I showed you originally. If they, they did one study looking at the FiO2 that is present in the oropharynx. So you had the um, nasal cannula in place. They measured the FiO2 in the hypopharynx, and same thing once one of those oral. And it was more uh, higher airway concentration uh, through the nasal airway as opposed to the non-rebreather mask. The other component is the exhalation. With the non-rebreather mask, you know, it's getting the oxygen in, and we're blowing out and some of that uh, CO2 is you know, still staying in the mask and coming back down. So that changes a little bit as far as the oxygen, uh, O2 absorption. So all these things, uh, as well as even the mechanical weight of a bag valve mask or a mask with a strap on it, a little more weight as far as the, uh, the tongue and the uh, oropharynx, those are all reasons why it's better and should be, and now it's becoming standard to do the uh, nasal airways, ideally, and nasal cannula continuous for your pre-oxygenation. As with any procedure, always make sure you have gloves on. That's the only uh, sterile way to do it. Um, continuous the whole time was really the key that we really uh, has become a major um, factor to continue the time or give us more time to do the intubation correctly the first time. Bag valve mask, same thing. It's a procedure. It's simple. The number of times I've had uh, patients are sonorous and people come running in and they're getting the airway cart and everything else and you walk up and you lift up their chin and then it's fine. It, it's, it's nothing different, so it's simple. And same thing with the device itself. You know, people push it down. You know, the technique is a very important. Proper positioning uh, of the uh, neck, the jaw. I have one person doing that with the seal of the mask and the other one bagging. Uh, really should be a two-person uh, technique to do that. Um, the position of the neck also, the ear to sternal notch, getting that straight line as best you can uh, makes the anatomy work best. With the, there are situations where it's actually even better to, to um, if you're going to bag valve mask them, even initially, sometimes it's better to do a paralytic because if they're fighting against you, you can't get good positioning and they're, um, it's just not a good technique sometimes to buy you some time. It's sometimes even better to paralyze the patient. But that's obviously with everything ready as soon as you do that. Um, so it's a mechanical thing uh, to do it right off the bat to keep it simple. Sometimes you cannot bag valve mask on the patients. It's uh, Uncle Charlie on the right there. Cricoid pressure. So let's uh, put this one. This was the best in the world. You push a cricoid down, they couldn't vomit, uh, and you would secure that airway. When they really did some uh, good research on this, even an MRI study, when you put the cricoid pressure and put pressure on the cricoid ring, it would actually displace the esophagus uh, over to the right. So that really doesn't help as far as the GI uh, component. In some situations, that's not the right position uh, of where you want the glottic opening. Um, as far as the intubation or any other airway management. It can actually compress the airway. So it's not what it's really intended to be, so it really should not be used. There's actually some significant downsides to it. Yet, on the other side, laryngeal manipulation, that is a good component. Uh, our trachea is actually a, you know, a mobile device, per se. So when we're doing any um, techniques, uh, in particular trying to get the patient intubated, you can move it somewhat to get it in the best position um, for the straight line externally looking down into the trachea. Um, so it really comes down to whoever's doing the intubation. They're going to manipulate it to where it's in the best position, have someone else hold it, or you have them move it and you tell them right where it is. Either way, get it where you want. It's slight manipulation to get in the best position. Um, it really needs to be a two-person technique. This is one example of the uh, CL grade. Um, it can go from a, uh, a better situation from a 3 to a 2 just by the manipulation and positioning of that uh, trachea. So, airway toys. We are EMS. We got lots of toys and we got lots of pockets. So, the first target, which I'm going to beat to death uh, for the flight crew, is the epiglottis. That is the only anatomic component in the oropharynx that you can use to detect. Um, your, your target, your ultimate target, is the uh, vocal cords, the glottic opening. 
So you have to see the epiglottis first. Doesn't matter. I mean, there's, anatomy can be distorted. That's the only thing that um, is really not is, is different than everything else down there. And it's also the uh, target for the devices that you're using for a um, for any intubation attempt. So, if you have a Mac blade, uh, which is usually emergency medicine EMS tend to do more than Mac, uh, you put the blade up in the in the blocula. If it's a Miller, uh, more anesthesia. This is all just what I've heard. Uh, it's more under the epiglottis to lift it up. The only exception to that would be um, you can use whichever you're more comfortable with. Um, the only exception would be for uh, pediatrics, uh, less than one year, everyone should be using the Miller because it's this big floppy epiglottis. But either one, whatever you're comfortable with, but just use it correctly in regards to the epiglottis. So why do we need to go through all the stuff? I've been doing it for years and just put the tube in the hole. And Johnny Gage and Roy DeSoto, been doing it a long time. I don't need to change a thing. I hear that from a lot of the senior residents. I'm um, sorry, some, some of the senior EMS providers and uh, flight crew. Been doing it a long time. I, I don't need to change it. I'm comfortable with this. Mac and Miller invented the blades in the 1940s. So why should we change it? Good research here, even by physicians. 20,000 physicians said, lucky strike, besides intubation, are really good for your throat, uh, protection against irritation and against cough, and obviously against intubation. Technology's there. I don't know why we need to change things. It's been great for years. Even this stuff was good. And if Johnny and Roy can do it, I guess I can too. Actually, I'm not a Miller, uh, Miller Blade guy, but <clears throat> it really opens up that airway nicely on that picture. So we need to be very comfortable with this and get, uh, get away from the standard traditional uh, direct laryngoscopy because it's not as successful as we wanted to do. And part of it is the technique, fine-tuning everything else. I use the analogy of the hook versus the lever. So as this picture shows, you want to push the hook, the laryngoscope, away from the patient. So if we're down at the feet, and I have people put it in the mouth, and just pull the stuff out of the way, you pull it away from the face. And then we get around the other side to do the intubation, and all of a sudden our mind's telling us more like a lever. We're kind of tilting it, and that's how we get some of the dental procedures done also with the device. So it's really a matter of getting, um, especially if you've been in that habit of kind of uh, using it as a lever as opposed to a hook. Uh, that's a big part, uh, I've been doing it for a long time, to try and change, and that's the hard, one of the hardest parts. Uh, so we can see our nice dental device here, and when we use that as a lever. As with any device, let's be very careful. We get uh, a little tensed up, and you know we can cause a little bit of damage, so be careful with these blades when you're uh, trying too hard. Obviously, that left lower one was from a Miller blade. So, EMS laryngoscope intubation, 60% of the time, it works every time. So we need to change what we need, to, that we've been doing for many years, uh, or at least to maximize uh, the, the best success of anything that we do. So this is one nice study that looked at the number of uh, intubation success rates at the number of attempts. So uh, a lot of the literature will go anywhere from 60% uh, success rate for uh, EMS intubation up to 80s. Um, this one is 75 for the first attempt, and that's uh, pretty much a lot what the other studies are showing also. So three out of four times we try to make the intubation, three out of four times we will. Um, the other time we have, I'm going to try again. You can see that the success rate starts to go up on the second attempt, up to 89, and uh, the third attempt is 96. Yet the, the success for each of those attempts starts dropping down. So it gets to the point between, the, you know, after the third and the fourth, your success rate's going down, but you're not increasing it that much more. So in essence, you really should not have more than three attempts at an EMS, uh, for EMS intubation. Um, there's, there's no benefit. If you keep trying, you can maybe get that other 96 to 98, but significantly longer uh, amount of time uh, and complications from that. So three attempts and then go to uh, rescue airway. Another study that showed this here, these uh, 2,000 patients, they had 98, 99% uh, of them were intubated. They didn't mention how many times they had, uh, had attempted before they got the intubation. But I found it kind of interesting up top, um, the two um, lines that uh, uh, the red underline, the success after more than one attempt and one rescuer 
uh, was 8.7%, and success after more than one and multiple rescuers uh, was uh, 4.6. So I've never really seen uh, any research on this, but it kind of makes sense. If you have two good providers, one goes in to try to make the invasion, first attempt, can't go in there, and someone else needs to go in there, it's probably better for that per first person to try again because they've already seen some of the anatomy, at least have some orientation when they go back in, as opposed to someone else trying to jump in and try and get that second attempt. There's no right or wrong. It's a situation. It depends on the providers. Uh, maybe that second one is going to be much better than the, the, the first provider's attempt. Um, but still, same process. Kind of interesting. This uh, another study. It's done in, um, in Europe um, by uh, EMS physicians. They actually have, on, on all their EMS units, they have a uh, physician. Um, and they have RSI medications also. So they did a study and found out that, yes, the physicians are better than the non-EMS physicians, which are usually the paramedic level. Um, but sometimes those non-EMS physicians have medications or not. So, yes, the physicians are better. I can I've been on both sides. So certainly the amount of time as far as training and uh, uh, careers for um, uh, emergency medicine buys you. It costs a lot, but buys you a lot of time to get, uh, get that, uh, uh, that experience. But yet on the other side, it does uh, say in the study that EMS was better with medications versus non-medications. I, I throw that analogy, which I've you know, been out there many times, where before we had medications out in the field, you go out there trying, a uh, patient needs the airway uh, secured, and yet they're combative enough, GCS of 5, uh, enough that you can intubate them, so you have to wait till they're hypoxic, and then they're out, then they're unresponsive, and then you can get the patient intubated. So the risk of that versus the risk of adding medications, as in uh, sedation or ideally RSI, um, I, th I think really makes a, a, a bigger issue, which is safer. It's, I think it's probably safer to secure that airway when needed, the appropriate way, but often medication is what we need to do that uh, to achieve that uh, appropriately. Again, whole nother topic, whole nother lecture just on the medications themselves. Um, but it will integrate into some of this other uh, discussion coming up. So the bougie, the elastic bougie, there's another, this is the more current one, there's other uh, types of bougies, but essentially I use it, the analogy of it's a smaller device into the bigger hole. We're putting this tube as opposed to an intracheal tube into a glottic opening, they're about the same size. This is, has a lot more uh, additional space to that. So the nice thing with this is you can actually change the angle, the elastic bougie, you can angle it, it it'll flesh out later, but uh, at least for initial approach, you can, uh, whatever situation you are in, anatomically, you can adjust that somewhat. Uh, the Comac Lahane uh, 3, this is a good example. If you have a 3, you can actually slide it, um, the bougie right underneath the epiglottis, and it, you have a, uh, a lot more room to be able to pass that potentially in the, the glottic opening, um, even though you don't even see the arytenoids um, for the uh, intubation attempt. With that, the other nice component of the bougie is you can feel, um, not all the time, but most of the times, you can feel the tracheal rings once you're in there. So once you're moving it, you know you're there. Uh, other than that, you do an intubation, you know it's in, you know it's in, you don't really feel completely convinced until you see the end title and got the breast sounds. Here, even before we put the, the ET tube in, we know we're kind of right on target. So this is, um, a lot of places, a, an adjunct to um, airway management. Uh, from our standpoint, uh, for all intubations, this is our standard intubation tool. For every intubation, instead of using a stylet, uh, using a bougie. As with anything else, though, there's no um, procedure or device that's perfect. One thing that does happen with the bougie is when you're passing the tube over the bougie, sometimes the uh, flange will uh, hang up on the right uh, retinoid. So you have to rotate it 90 degrees. So just knowing that ahead of time, simple, smooth, sometimes rotating them all. Even, even, before it even hangs up is, uh, is always a good thing to do. So, nice device. Pictures here following are really to show kind of the difference of why um, we're kind of pushing the bougie versus just the regular endotracheal intubation. Four pictures for um, just a uh, standard intubation. Um, and it, obviously they have a camera that's uh, uh, much, much closer, but uh, top right epiglottis. Got the MAC blade in the molecular, excellent. Um, even with this, even with the camera, you can see the target on the left lower, um, the uh, vocal cords, is really kind of diminished uh, from the vision standpoint. And now we put a tube 
You can see that tube, you can see the glottic opening, but as soon as you put the tube in front of it, you've lost uh, direct vision of that. So in that picture, it looks like it's in the glottic opening, and that certainly may be and probably is. But as opposed to seeing, well, here's some other pictures. You can see that the larger tube really then gets down towards the anatomy, and because it's larger, it helps block some of the vision. Uh, so that bottom left, I'm not quite sure if it's in the you know glottic opening or down the esophagus, and same with the top right. It's kind of hard to tell in many situations. Other times, it's nice and clear. But with the bougie, smaller device, it just makes it that much easier to still see some of the anatomy um, with a smaller device. And it's a smaller thing to put in a bigger hole. It gets a lot more uh, room for any error or adjustments. Now, that bottom left picture, I'm not sure if that's a Foley catheter, but I don't think we're going to get the uh, endotracheal tube in there. So these are uh, two good pictures of really how it's uh, best done as a two-person technique. So it's actually Keith Micucci, our director of uh, Medivac, brought up the whole uh, situation. He says, well, why don't we do it as two people? I said, well, that makes sense. So we call it the Micucci technique. So the primary provider there is going to be doing the intubation, has the, uh, has the um, the laryngoscope blade in and has the bougie. Um, the other provider is doing laryngeal manipulation. Um, so when the primary provider gets the bougie uh, into the trachea, peels the cords, uh, then the other provider can put the ET tube over top of the bougie. The primary provider then uh, passes the tube on down over the bougie. So the nice thing with this, by staying there, you're keeping the keeping the sight of your target, seeing that the uh, seeing that the bougie actually went into the uh, glottic opening. Um, and it's staying there. You're keeping the soft tissue out of the way. You're seeing that it's still open. You're still seeing where the target is. And then you also see the endotracheal tube pass in uh, to the glottic opening over the um, bougie. So having the two-person technique and keeping that blade in the whole time really is a, uh, a significant benefit uh, to the process. So that's our direct laryngoscopy and all the variations uh, to make that uh, the most successful component. 2016, we now have lots of toys, the video laryngoscopy. Um, so the nice thing with this is because of the technology, we don't have to have that straight line uh, with a, a direct laryngoscopy. So we can see from the outside to the inside. This then has a technology to um, show us the picture uh, where the tip of this is, even if it's a natural uh, anatomy um, configuration at the time. It's nice because the camera's really close, as opposed to us being farther away for a direct laryngoscopy. Uh, it can, gets magnified uh, through the technology. You can see the anatomy in detail a lot better than from a distance, uh, even with uh, some secretions. Some studies uh, show better success rates uh, for the video, uh, video laryngoscopy versus direct. Um, some say it's faster, some say it's slower, but it uh, depends on the device itself. Limitations. Every device, every technique has its, uh, has its positives and negatives. In this one, if you have any secretions, blood, mucus, it's going to cover the, the, the uh, camera. You're not going to be able to see anything. Um, visibility, if it's outside, bright light, you know, in the sun, some of the screens are a little bit different. Intensities are a little bit different, but sometimes can be a factor, sometimes not. But most importantly is the batteries. Nothing worse than being in there about to try to pass a tube, and then the... Uh, the video laryngoscope goes off uh, and you're completely out of that situation. So as with all equipment, having that ready. There are not to uh, promote uh, any one device or another, but um, a couple different styles. The On the left upper C-Mac, uh, left lower McGrath, which we're going to start to use. Um, and on the right is the Pentax and the AirTrack. And then the King Vision video, which I'll show you in a minute, is what we're currently using. So essentially, the um, CMAC and the McGrath are a traditional intubation technique, but you have um, the actual video uh, at the tip of the blade itself, but still it's a standard uh, intubation technique. The uh, Pentax air track and then the King Vision video, um, you actually have a channel within the blade that the tube goes down. So the, the nice thing is that if you look on the lower right, Right where that, uh, as opposed to having a three-dimensional, the tube is already there. It's right where the camera is. So it's really just moving it just all of a couple centimeters forward to get it in, because the tube's already there, to get it into the glottic opening. Uh, the only downside we've had with ours is that the positioning is very important. If you get too close um, to the glottic opening, the, the tube is a little bit lower than it appears on the screen. 
So there, it's the same thing with any technique, fine-tuning. On this slide on the left, you actually see a standard uh, a direct laryngoscopy. And even this is with a camera, but you get the perception of it's darker, it's deeper, it's smaller, you don't see the details as much. Um, and everyone's distance is different depending on your eyesight. Sometimes people put their glasses on to do the intubation. Sometimes they take them off. Some people go in closer and further away, bending their arm different. Um, and that's all based on the eyesight, but as opposed to the video laryngoscopy where it's you got the screen there. Um, so you don't have to deal with that quite as much either. And when you get down there, some of the details that you may not be able to really appreciate uh, from a direct laryngoscopy, you can get more information, some ugly information. Um, with the video devices themselves. So this is a EMS uh, device utilization. I think it's really probably more the emergency department. Um, essentially, they're getting more and more video devices coming out and uh, less use of direct laryngoscopy. Um, no, neither of these are, this is the best, you should only use one or the other. Both have their implications. Uh, both should be used to some extent, depending on the situation and the environment that you're that you're working in. So, video versus standard intubation. Looking at uh, one study, looked at uh, the differences between the two. Uh, first attempt success rate was uh, fairly significantly higher, 91 percent versus 68 um, for the video. Now it doesn't really mention which which device this is actually for the video. But uh, other big difference between was the esophageal intubation, uh, zero percent uh, for the video uh, laryngoscope versus the 14% for direct laryngoscopy. Same thing, we kind of lose that vision at the last minute um, when we're passing the tube down with the regular direct laryngoscopy. So that's trying to get something into the hole. Let's, if we can't do that, let's put something around the hole. So then we're going to our supraglottic airway devices. So again, not promoting one or the other. There's two different uh, styles per se. Uh, upper left is the IGL, left lower is the King LTSD, uh, right upper is the combi tube, and right lower is the LMA. <coughs> Excuse me. There's, there's lots of different, number of different devices, but they kind of all fit into these uh, different models. So the upper left IGL and the right lower uh, LMA, um, their concept is we're going to take the tube and it, uh, we have the ability to surround the glottic opening. Uh, with the LMA, it's the air uh, airbag, essentially. And with the IGL, it's the material, which is a bit softer and actually will um, um, follow the anatomy around the glottic opening. As compared to the uh, LTSD on the left lower and the coming tube right upper, they use the balloons, you know, as we know. Then one goes in the esophagus, you inflate that balloon and one up in the oropharynx and then the area in between, that's where the air comes out. So one is following the anatomy and one is uh, kind of blocking uh, the anatomy above and below the glottic opening. So they're kind of different. This one actually uh, I came across was um, cadaver with two different types of devices. One on the left was the LMA and the right was the King LT. King LT by far is the most prominent and very effective uh, supraglottic airway that's being used in EMS. Theoretically, I've always had uh, um, mechanical concerns about it. Uh, with the combi tube, you had the uh, lower balloon for the lower tube, which probably is less pressure than the upper balloon. Here it's one, easier to do, quicker, yet the same pressure. Uh, I don't know if that has any uh, difference. But the thing is the positioning. So you insert the uh, King LT all the way down to a certain part marked on the teeth. You inflate the balloon and then you start trying the bag and then you slide it up until the ventilation goes through okay. So that's, uh, that's good if it's in the right position. The question if it's not in the right position, you can ventilate something else. Again, it's not been established mechanically. We're kind of taking that blind shot. Um, with the LMA, again, being placed, it's a very good backup. The downside is the um, LMA out in the field is not going to stay in place very well at all. There's really nothing to hold it in place. Um, so if you're moving the patient, have the bag valve or have the bag on top of it, um, can really be displaced pretty readily. Uh, King LT obviously is fairly well secured just with the bagging system it has. IGL, same thing. Um, been used in Europe. I've known a number of people who've used that. They said um, really doesn't get a great uh, esophageal um, connection. So they still can have some uh, regurgitation through that. 
And part of it, I'm not sure if that's because there wasn't any uh, securing device. They now had that one as part of the package. So another, it's nice that there's no balloon. It's just an insertion and a good uh, bike lock component. The study um, really just looked at different um, devices in the tracheal tube versus LMA versus uh, EOA uh, from way back when. So which had the best uh, results? Statistically, the only thing had some difference was return of spontaneous circulation uh, of cardiac arrest before arriving in the hospital. Um, a little bit higher on endotracheal intubation versus the other two. Other than that, it was really not much different uh, on all the other uh, outcomes that they looked at. So <clears throat> simulation training. A whole bunch of toys. Let's throw them all in. Let's play with them. Find out which ones uh, are the best. So in this study, they had um, you know, 100 providers between EMS and uh, emergency medicine. So they did all the devices. Uh, so that was the CMAC, GlideScope, AirTrack, King LTSD, and Laryngoscope. Um, interestingly enough, with those devices, which are all very different, they had about the same uh, success rates on the first attempt uh, and overall. What they did find was that the uh, King LTSD was the quickest and the combi or CMAC was actually preferred on those devices. Um, again, it doesn't tell you one thing or the other, um, but lots of different things that can be done. Uh, we need to find out what is the best, but also what are we the best at ourselves too. So the supraglottic airway, if we look at um, cardiac arrest, so the, the re resuscitation of cardiac arrest is really still um, pretty low. Uh, witness cardiac arrest, AED, different story per se. But as far as the airway management, uh, to try to lay down on the floor, you know, EMS, um, laying down on the floor, trying to do an intubation while they're doing chest compressions, takes a long time, it's gonna interrupt the chest compressions. So the question is, should we, by far standard, um, for uh, any cardiac arrest supraglottic uh, uh, airway. I, I think it really makes the most sense, at least to get the things initiated so that you're not uh, interrupting the rest of the process, taking a lot more time, success rates can be very difficult in those situations. And if you are going to put a supraglottic airway in, certainly using a laryngoscope blade, and I know a number of agencies that are, are using that, um, at least help get the soft tissue out of the way also, same as for an intubation, but with a supraglottic airway, you can see it going in. You can see the depth and the anatomy and so forth, so that really should be standard between the two of them. All right, let's put this one to rest also. The good old nasotracheal intubation. That was a, during my residency, that was a, that was a lot of fun. You had the patients that you didn't want to RSI, uh, the severe CHF patient. So rather than, um, rather than um, do uh, RSI and put them down and intubate the patient, um, we're just going to do a nasotracheal intubation. So we put this tube in, a lot of gel, and you shove it down the nose. And when they're coughing, then you move the tube. And when they cough, we used to have a whistle, and you hear it, and you shove it on into the trachea. Really neat, because they would be intubated. They wouldn't have to be uh, uh, RSI. <coughs> Downside is, well, that's uh, CPAP. Uh, before they had CPAP, the CPAP back then was continuous pushing and pulling. Uh, besides the damage and then the stress putting the patient under. So good old days, but uh, take that one off the list of the options. Future devices, <coughs> neat toys. I think if that, on that left side, if you can get that device in, you can actually see the, uh, the uh, trachea itself. So surgical airway. Um, it, it's, it's not that we, it's not always the last choice. Most of the times it should be the last choice. We don't want to go jumping and doing a surgical airway. But if you do, you need to get in there quickly when it's indicated. So I use the analogy of the squished lemon. You know, okay, all those things are off. Uh, our class four plus uh, airway that we have to deal with um, just can't get in there. So going through the process, do you have to take a look at everything else before you do a surgical airway? It really depends on the situation. Sometimes you think there's no way there's going to be an airway, but you can take a peek. You know, put the blade in and take a look, and sometimes you'd be surprised. Sometimes it's not what you thought it would be and still be able to get the patient intubated uh, or some other airway device. But at the same time, you don't want to go spending a lot of time trying to figure out doing everything else, taking all the time before you find out that uh, you need to do a surgical airway, but you've lost time to do that. If there's a situation where there could be a compromise of the airway, um, they're okay now, but 15 minutes from now, I might not have that option. So the example is the, um, the inhalation burn. It's a little striderous, airway's okay right now, but you know it's gonna get more edematous and can actually close off that option. So uh, the burn looks okay, you may wanna get early, get the patient RSI'd um, before that then gets worse, 
and then you would have to go for a surgical airway, and even that can be difficult with the burns. Um, if you can oxygenate and ventilate, again, depending on the situ situation, it's, it seems horrible, but all we can do is bag valve mask. But if we can do that effectively, it depends on the situation where you're at and you know, transport time and so forth, um, that's still the best thing to do. Um, but if you can't do that immediate surgical airway, if it's something that's going to be compromised, you can do that now, but it's going to be compromised and need to go to surgical airway. Uh, those are your decisions. So you don't jump right on it, but when you do jump on it, you jump on it very aggressively. Uh, the problem with it, it's really not a uh, extremely difficult thing to do. <clears throat> the, the problem has been hesitation and not doing this as with any procedure, doing it a lot. Um, so the biggest recommendation I always say is go deep. I use this uh, picture here to show the anatomy, um, soft tissue above the uh, cricothyroid membrane, and then the esophagus, how far back it is behind it. So if you're making cuts, you got a little way to go down to get to it, and then if you're going past it, you got a good way to go down past it also. So, uh, as you know, finding the cricothyroid membrane, um, and coming from uh, horizontal or vertical, um, as far as your initial decision, or your incision. Initially, especially if, unless it's a really clearly defined and go right for the horizontal uh, incision, but probably best it, at least to get good anatomy, make sure you have the, um, at least the thyroid cartilage, you know, in place, you know, securing it because it's going to move around a little bit. But once you start, make sure it's, uh, you, know, you have it in place. Vertical incision over top of the cricothyroid membrane, so one, you can <coughs> clearly identify it and gives you more space to make that even wider. Once you do, then you want to get into the cricothyroid membrane, deeper hole, and go horizontally. The times that this has not happened almost always is having gone deep enough, gotten in the soft tissue, uh, and number two, when you have gone and gotten in the cricothyroid membrane, not making the hole big enough that the device can actually get in, uh, in past that uh, incision. Um, so that once you do have it open, depends on your program. Uh, lots of different devices you can put in there, even if it's a bougie and uh, 6080 tube or the individual uh, tubes themselves, at least having them all ready. So it's always concerned about the incision going to bleed. Well, first of all, it's going to bleed even just without hitting the big vessels, just because the thyroid, uh, thyroid glands there are a lot of, uh, even just the blood vessels in the sub-Q tissue. Um, they're going to bleed a lot. So a lot of this is all just by palpation sometimes. You see on the uh, picture on the left, the cr uh, cricoid uh, arteries and the IJs are both there, and they're off to the side. You have to be careful going to the side. But the picture on the right really shows you that the depth is very different. So you've got a lot of space. Um, as far as hitting those vessels, you're going to have to go pretty for, uh, for their posterior, even from your initial incision. So it's a lot, lot more uh, space to the vessels as it seems like on, the, on our initial interpretation. And whoever does it does very nice jobs. Here's our general surgery, surgical airway. And our plastic surgeons, looks wonderful. And in emergency medicine, we're very aggressive. And hey, you can even see the airway through this, through our incision. And we just wanted to prove to you that if you go really wide, you still haven't hit the carotid artery. So that's, that's probably the more um, appropriate technique for emergency medicine. So the patient is intubated and they're oxygenated and ventilated, and all of a sudden they start to decompensate. They're fine, and they start going down. you got to figure out what's going on. They're really keeping it, everything, like everything else, keeping it simple. We're thinking of more complex things about their ejection fraction everything else. Well, no, we, the oxygen tube came off of the, uh, came off of the vent. Um, so real quick, the, uh, the POET um, is the acronym I use for Position Obstruction Equipment and Tension Pneumothorax. You check those first three things. Sometimes it's a matter of just, okay, redo the whole thing, reintubate and so forth, depends on the situation. But it's often one of those things is why the patient that was doing fine all of a sudden starts to decompensate. Um, DOPE is the other uh, um, acronym for that. I don't use that because that's actually displaced obstruction pneumothorax uh, and equipment. And really, I think the POET is really the appropriate order um, so that uh, you do the first three and if not, uh, it's a tension pneumo, and you jump right on the on that. But again, that, there's different situations. But if you're doing fine, and everything else, and all of a sudden it goes down, look at one. It's usually one of these uh, four things. All right, septic intubation. While these are probably the most critical patients that you're going to run into um, uh, in the emergency department, even in the ICU, 
uh, certainly the intubation component is a major factor also, a uh, significant challenge. So I'm spending a couple slides on that um, because it's, it's something really get caught off guard. And these ones, once you start going the wrong direction, it's going to be very difficult to, uh, to, uh, to get back. So why is it such an issue with septic patients? Well, they desaturate very quickly, markedly hypotensive, uh, readily uh, from their volume standpoint. Um, positive pressure ventilation increases in the uh, pressure in the chest, decreases the, the right-sided right uh, heart flow, uh, can drop the pressure then. Their uh, metabol metabolism is different. You could put the medications on board. They're not going to get uh, as effective as quickly as, as possible. And these patients become fatigued. So they have very little room, very little reservation um, once, that, uh, once it starts to hit them. So they have, the, they have less O2, and when they have less O2, it doesn't work as well. So the whole uh, acidosis between the uh, respiratory and uh, metabolic, classic as far as septic patients, um, even when it's functioning right, um, internally doesn't work as well. So they have a relative uh, hypoxemia. They don't have the reserve, uh, like the, the classic example is like you have a CHF, you put them on BiPAP, boom. They're really wiped out, they're just about to be intubated, but they're going okay, well enough, you put them on BiPAP, they get a break and then they get the BiPAP off and they're doing better. You get the situation in a septic patient where they're that fatigued, they are not going to improve, they're going to get uh, much worse very quickly. So this is where you have to get very aggressive. If they start to look like they're going in the wrong direction, get on top of it because they're, they're going there, going there quickly. Um, CO2, again, getting back to the whole metabolism and um, the whole metabolic component of that, essentially, you can't always rely just on that number. Uh, a lot of patients will watch the CO2, and if it's getting off, that's really an early decision to say, yep, we really need to start going that direction. And kind of the opposite in here. If they're looking, uh, they're not looking very well, and the CO2 seems okay, that may, uh, they may get worse, uh, fatigue much quicker even before the CO2 actually st uh, starts to show um, that retention. So we want to maximize the hemodynamics and oxygenation. You give fluids, even CHF patients, 30 cc's per kilo, uh, put that fluid on board, uh, even though a CHF patient, unless they're in overt failure, because these are the ones, that what's always going to happen when a truly septic patient, there's going to vasodilate out and you can't fill it up quick enough. Early um, uh, utilization of vasopressors, uh, vasopressors for getting that uh, blood pressure up. But same thing with the oxygenation. Maximize everything we've done with the oxygenation. Um, and position, as we told, talked about before, is even more critical in these patients. They have very little reserve. Pre-oxygenating, again, time-wise, we're going to try and max them maybe a little bit quicker because we had to get them intubated even, even quicker, and they may not oxygenate even better after a couple minutes. Um, so what we can do is where normally you would uh, pre-oxygenate um, RSI of the patient. They become apneic. Usually we don't ventilate them. Just start with the uh, intubation with the continuous nasal uh, oxygenation. But here, you actually may want to maximize it. So even bag valve mask, 100% O2, even while they're paralyzed before you do the intubation. It's one of the situations where you want to keep that uh, up because they have no reserve. After the intubation, again, they're vasodilated. Um, you really need the uh, low pressure, interthoracic pressure, um, and smaller volumes as best you can to oxygenate and ventilate, but also not to compromise them from a circulation standpoint. Once their pressure starts coming up and they get um, a little more uh, reactive um, to the normal um, oxygenation and uh, ventilation and more importantly the circulation, then you can actually start to increase the interthoracic pressure and the volumes and the uh, rates and the uh, PEEP. So one study looking at uh, for sepsis patients, RSI meds, all right, atomidate, causes hypotension, don't use on a septic patient. You know, a number of studies really came down and said, you know, it doesn't make a difference as far as the hypotension. Um, but the nice thing is we have a couple of different choices. So in this example, uh, ketamine uh, on some patients makes them transiently hypertensive. So between the two, if both aren't um, uh, any significant risk, well, let's use a ketamine. Uh, and same thing with rocuronium and uh, succinylcholine. Um, the SUX has multiple different uh, potential things, and hyperkalemia in a septic patient uh, certainly can happen if it's been going on for a while. So in this situation, good. Two very good drugs. Either one will work, but let's, uh, you know, one thought is having the uh, rocuronium. So the ketamine and rocuronium are probably better choices. Um, not that the literature is saying it's much uh, 
much safer, but it's probably just better choices for that since we have uh, those options. But uh, as that last statement there is, consider all low doses. They don't metabolize well, and the side effects of some of these medications can be amplified in the sepsis patient. So get a good dose, but really try to minimize that uh, to an effective dose. So the question is, from an airway standpoint, how well do we do it? Well, getting back to some of the uh, literature, this is a good one from Japan, 650,000 patients. Uh, they had better survival with bag valve mask compared to endotracheal intubation or even the supraglottic airway. Um, when you look at it, it's kind of interesting that 57% uh, uh, of the patients were bag valve mask. 34% were uh, supraglottic airway, and 6% were endotracheal intubation. So if they are only doing very few intubations in their cardiac arrest, I, su I su uh, suspect that it's not going to get a good outcome, probably because they're not doing the procedure frequently enough or well enough. Um, so I'm not sure which, uh, you know, that, that component that makes it worse. So it is, but it, the good thing is you're actually starting to look at what's the, what do we do, what's the best that we can do. Um, so just one component here, it's not the intubation in the study, it's significantly worse, it still may be, but just the numbers are uh, really skewed to be able to give that good answer of which is the best. So I looked at, you know, there's been a lot of literature as far as uh, um, airway management by EMS, uh, but I really looked for some comparisons, so I did it from the emergency department. So this one study in the uh, tertiary care center in Australia, uh, 300 patients, um, essentially, they had 29% complications. First pass success rate, 83%. That's kind of a high end, uh, but still an EMS first pass success uh, in the field. Um, but the complications were like uh, 29%. Um, cardiac arrest, 2.2% with the intubation. This one looked at in the emergency department. Uh, post cardiac arrest, or post intubation cardiac arrest, 23% uh, of the patients uh, that had the RSIs went into. Uh, post-intubation post cardiac arrest. So, um, you know, they ended up being the same. <clears throat> so my point is, when you look at this, it's not just that this is EMS. Uh, even the emergency department, these are challenges. It's just a very different um, situation, different environment for uh, EMS and your medical. So these are just the questions that kind of come up. Um, do we delay the chest compressions for uh, endotracheal intubation out in the field? Answer as well, yeah, I'm sure we do. Does it add more time? Yeah, most likely, I'm sure it does, as opposed to a supraglottic airway. But if you move the patient, bag valve mask, is that better than endotracheal tube when you're trying to oxygenate and ventilate a patient when you're moving a patient out of the field? Uh, I think it's probably better with the ET tube. Um, time on scene, are we spending too much time uh, doing endotracheal intubation? Uh, is that a cost or benefit in the situation? Um, should you be doing all the resuscitation on scene? So for cardiac arrest, yeah, pretty much, yeah. There's, if you, what you do there, if you can do it uh, and get it done and get a good response as far as cardiac arrest, probably not going to be much different. Now different as far as um, like acute MIs or um, trauma patients where they need the tertiary care. If you're just uh, sustaining them until they can get that. Other questions. So air medical. Now... You have the challenge of getting on situations where ground has not been, uh, because of difficult airways, the ground providers have not been able to get the uh, intubation. Now, that's a, even a harder job to go in. The patient that can't be intubated, for you guys have to go in to uh, intubate the patient. Now, a lot of times, different scenarios, you have, uh, we have obviously the RSIs, which in some areas they don't, some they do. Um, but another challenge. If the patient's not intubated, so let's say, okay, let's do the supraglottic airway. When they come to the emergency department, they're going to be intubated in the emergency department. Uh, yes, more controlled. It's so nice, though. <laughs> From the emergency medicine standpoint, the patient comes in already intubated. It's nice we get to do the intubation if they're not, but at the same time for process flow and getting them up to the cath lab, if they're already intubated, that helps. But again, it's not right or wrong. It's just uh, other components. Success rates of RSI versus non-RSI. Um, it's uh, the classic, I've been through this a lot, where... The patient's GCS of 5 before we even had meds, and you have to wait till they become hypoxic <clears throat> and unresponsive, and then you can intubate them, uh, as opposed to, you know, medications, putting them down, putting them down early for, the, for when it is indicated, uh, indicated for them to get intubated. Um, but it still comes down to the same factors to make that happen as with any procedure. 
This is one uh, analogy I give to uh, even emergency medicine physicians who don't know EMS uh, or the intensivist. So you have the attending physician and you got uh, the best nurse there and the two of you are going to be there. 380 pound patient rolls in in cardiac arrest. You're in the emergency department, have all your equipment right with you. So for 15 minutes, you guys are going to do uh, CPR, start the IV, get the patient intubated, defibrillate them, do all those things, just the two of you, for 15 minutes. And that, that's what it is in EMS. But not only are you in the room, you're now down a hill, they got the car tipped over, and they get you out, get you down there, and doing the same thing, but in that environment. So I don't, so the success rates for um, EMS intubations, in particular field, they, they, they really are going to be worse because the situation and the environment is far worse than uh, even the pristine uh, emergency department. Yet it still is the key of what we need to do to make this the best. Um, what's the best way to approach it? Uh, and the way we do approach it, what's the best way to make sure it's working well? So first part, training. <clears throat> um, as with aviation, so getting experience, doing these things over and over and over again. Um, any opportunity that you have, um, you know, from the simulator, doing it, doing it, doing it. Uh, standard intubations, difficult ones. Um, if you can do, you know, obviously the OR is very nice uh, in some factors, difficult in others, but at least you get to see the anatomy. Um, any of the um, advanced airway uh, management courses where you can actually do cadavers, spectacular. You get to see the differences in the anatomy. Um, different scenarios, the environment, um, if you can do it... Uh, uh, even for like simulation, um, doing a uh, patient management, critical patient management in a sim lab versus in the back of an ambulance, uh, I think really has a big component there also. Videotaping de and debriefing after any training, see what, you know, we know what we're doing, but then you look at it and say, oh, I didn't realize that, I can, I can change that. And again, I keep going to the analogy, this is the same thing as far as aviation uh, for, the, uh, for the pilots. They take off and land, take off and land, take off and land. But then a lot of the training from aviation is really uh, worst case scenario. Okay, lost the engine. What are you going to do? Okay, you um, now lost your instruments. And what are you going to do? They, that's continuously, big part of it is the uh, uh, adverse uh, situations um, that you need to deal with. And the same thing with the airway. We don't do that well enough. Um, and really the whole process of an intubation is really um, down to the standards and very basics. I take uh, our medevac pilots and I show them, okay, here's, here's this blade, pull this stuff out of the way and put this plastic tube into that hole down there. And they do that and they lift, lift the stuff out of the way and put the, the tube in. They're not thinking about the anatomy, they're not thinking about the, the whole process, keeping it very simple and they're very good at it. So when I show them once, they can do it repeatedly, it's successful every time. So at this point, the EMS pilots are going to be doing the airway management in the helicopter and the uh, airway management uh, for the patients themselves also. So next steps, besides uh, training is experience. Um, one study looked at uh, the emergency medicine residents. Uh, they had to do 50, uh, 50 intubations uh, before they got as comfortable and as reliable as the attending physician. For difficult, it was up to about 200 in, in those scenarios. Um, but you know, as with this, the uh, complicated intubation bowel incontinence ratio uh, really gets reduced the more you uh, do this. But this is also why attending physicians have long lab coats and uh, our flight crews wear dark uh, flight suits. So experience, get the tubes whenever we have the opportunity. Uh, experience along those lines, really good numbers here. Uh, shows uh, first attempt, and then after you know having the experience of 20 intubations uh, from left to right. First attempt, 60%. Um, a lot of research goes along those lines, 80% uh, percent, um, for multiple attempts up until uh, 80 and then 90s. So markedly improved success rates based on experience. Uh, that's with intubations, but also with uh, many other procedures you do. Competency, getting the training, getting the correct training um, by the right people is another component also here. This is why I don't use a Miller grade. And checklist, again, another aviation analogy. Um, this is something I have, uh, obviously, for the flight crew, but also for, for uh, my ground EMS providers. As with anything else, it's those things that you do all the time that you're going to forget something. And that's a critical thing. Aviation standpoint, before they do a simple takeoff, it's the little things that could be catastrophic. 
and that's why they run down the checklist. So same thing with the intubation. I guarantee you someone's going to forget one of these things or they don't check the list. So my recommendation, not when, you, when you're with a patient or even right before you get there, you know, it's an option that you're probably going to need to intubate. Just zip through this. So nasal airways, uh, pre-oxygenation, nasal O2, elevate, uh, pre-ventilation, getting your primary equipment ready and medications for the uh, RSI, for the uh, air medical crew. Um, having your equipment uh, back up and ready, have the medications available for the RSI when you're doing that. Laryngeal manipulation, intubation, uh, ET2, uh, end title, and physical exam confirmation. And then analgesia sedation in either situations. Go through that list, take a peek at it before you go in to do an intubation, and it will make a difference of forgetting one or two of those things, which is important. So when is this procedure complete? It is complete when you transfer the tube so someone else is going to manage it. So you arrive with the patient and said, okay, you got the tube, I got the tube, okay, you got the tube. Uh, document that really well. There's nothing worse. You know, a lot of times it's, well, when I see the end title, then the, the procedure's done. No. It doesn't matter if you get the tube in. If it doesn't stay in, then the procedure's not completed. So document that well because if it does come out where it's found not to be in the right place, the question is, did that happen before uh, you handed the patient off or after? Very, very important uh, for any procedure. So different environment, but pre hospital intubations, you got to be aggressive, but you got to be gentle. Um, I use the two-finger analogy. If there's anything you're doing with the airway where you have to use any force, you're going to do damage. And if you're using force, it means something's not right. Positioning, uh, something along those lines is not right. So be very gentle with it, but at the same time, get it done. So factors in the, to summarize the whole thing. How do we do this to get the best that we can? Training, lots of training, devices, whatever one you're going to use. Um, obviously, with our program, we have those uh, primaries. But get very good at that. Be good at a backup, um, but be very good at uh, your primary. There's a lot of toys out there, and people use a whole bunch of them but never get experience with them. That's probably not the, the best situation. Um, from our standpoint, looking at, well, how well are we doing, it's good to think of how, how good we're doing, but then look at the data. So collecting the data and looking at the outcomes, it's really comes down to the medical director and the program to figure out, uh, to analyze it, what's the best that we can do or what do we need to change. But with every procedure, take your time. Evaluation, all those tools we talked about, everyone's going to be different. Um, so before you even start that, anticipate what the approach needs to be, what the complication could be. Be ready. Always have everything lined up. Take your time. The quickest intubation is the slowest attempt. So if you take your time, do it smooth, one step at a time, your success rate's going to be much higher than if you try and get it done real quickly. Get it done real quickly, you failed, you have to do two attempts. It takes much longer than the slow first attempt, and that's most important. And if you need help, call for help. If you're going to hold off on doing something until it can be best managed as a group, then do what is best for the patient and you. So what is our goal? Our goal is a patient. I mean, we are type A. I want to I want to put it in the tracheal tube in. I pass. I'm an air, airway guy. I can put the tube in. That's I either do it or I don't. I, I pass or I fail. And that's not the situation at all. Take care of your patient. Whatever it is for the individual situation. Um, we need to oxygenate. We need to ventilate them well. They need to have good outcome. That's what it comes down to. Is the outcome. I know we want to say yes. I did that. That no one else can do. Um, but the bigger challenge, much more a higher level, sophisticated is. Um, all these approaches and evaluations, what's what's the best situation? That's what the expert does. And when you do, the patients are very happy, surviving, and very, very appreciative for what we do for their airway. So I always go back to the uh, old quote I've heard a number of times for emergency medicine in EMS. Uh, other physicians and so forth say, yeah, that you're, you're the, drac uh, the jack of all trades and the master of none. Uh, the reality is, uh, yeah, we're the, uh, we deal with every specialty's uh, critical patients, every specialty's, um, but we are the masters of the airways. You take an anesthesiologist or even an emergency physician and put them out in the field in the situations we're in and try and get that procedure done, EMS and air medical does it far better than those physicians. So yes, you are the masters. So you already have the focus, you have the direction, it's taking care of what we can do. It's refining all the resources that we have to achieve the best results.